Welcome to the Love That Guy podcast. We are your hosts. I'm Ronnie Jean Blevins. And this is Brendan Reynolds. He got third all for billing at the end of each picture. That don't really mean much. He would say with a grin. But he held my hand tight when he pawned his name out. Only four or five names down below Errol Flynn. We are the show that celebrates the journeyman actors, the actors we all know and love. And even though we might not always know their names, we inevitably see them in film and television and think to ourselves, I love that guy. Today's guest is the quintessential love that guy. I had the privilege of working with him on a culturally phenomenal show back in 2010, but I have admired this man for years. We've loved him in The Wire. We've loved him in 8mm. We've loved him in True Blood. First time I remember seeing him was in Devil's Advocate. He made me so uncomfortable I wanted to walk out of the theater. But his performance was so great, I thought to myself, who the hell is this guy? And I've been following him ever since. It's actors like Chris that are the reason that we do this show. He recently wrote something simple and beautiful. Art is definitely not a career. Neither is love instead of hate. It's just a way of being alive. I don't know him well, but I'm a great judger of book covers. A few phrases that come to mind when I think of Chris are without pretense, beginner's mind, eternally chasing the magic of the present moment. I love this guy. I love his spirit. I love what he represents. And above all, I love his acting. Welcome to the show, the incomparable Chris Bauer. Oh, my awesome. God, man. You guys, give me a second to take that in. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I mean, that is so kind of you. Hey, man, say. it's true. That's great. It's true. You know, it's like it's like um, all true. You know, you don't. We're, we're, we're this community, right? As, as actors and, and some, when it, when it's working well, it, it's beautiful, but it also can be like kind of a gross type thing, you know, but, um, even though we work together briefly, you know, it's like you get a, you, you, you understand someone's essence mm-hmm. from jump street and that's kind of, so that's, yeah, it's Dude, all true. that's why I'm here, man, because, you know, I got the same vibe from you. Thanks, man. And that was, however long ago that was but you know i'm so grateful for that part of my instincts it's the whole yeah it's where everything comes from right Mm -hmm. right and they guide you man if you listen to them for sure i mean and i have like i have uh it's funny i i've worked i find myself like uh qualifying people like like uh that i that i felt like i've known for years Mm -hmm. but maybe i worked with them two years ago and i'm like oh like uh like stephen Ogg is a good example uh we only worked together like two years ago but i'm like oh he's like a best friend and then someone might be like well didn't you guys just meet i'm like (laughs) well yeah i guess we just happens quick but you bond quick on set right (laughs) yeah i mean i mean you know if you're if you're lucky i think yeah Yeah. you know if you're if you're i guess i think of it as luck but the the channel that all this stuff has to come out of is is for me it's not a one-way deal it's all about what's coming back also right. so right sure yeah being, being receptive to that yeah man is, that's that's a career to me that's how I, I would when i look over my shoulder because i don't think about my career at all but it's just all that shit back there mm-hmm. yeah but it is that it's connections and it's picking up um little bits and piece little gifts little chunks of generosity from strangers along the way mm-hmm. you know I, in my opinion, they're sort of like the unconscious messengers of the muses mm-hmm. who, whom, from whom my talent comes and for whom, you know, I have to maintain respect, really. That's beautiful, That's man. I love that. Mm-hmm. I, um, I, I, I was noticing that you're, you kind of have this fascinating uh, beginning because it seems like you were born in the Mecca of show business, but you went, you went everywhere else, you know, Connecticut and, and uh, Chicago. It's almost like you fought so hard to shed your California identity <laughs> and to be known as an East coast actor. Is there truth to that? <laughs> Cause you, you, um, I would say there's, it's a, it, there's truth to your perception of that, but <laughs> I, all I ever did is try to get the role that I was auditioning for. Mm. And, uh, you know, Put it this way, I 
I paraphrased some chapter in a Stephen Hawking book where basically my understanding of the concept was if you get a most power, a, a more power, the most powerful microscope you can, you're going to see the same shit in, in far space atomically as us. And I remember when I read that, I was like, that means technically I should be able to play anything. Mm -hmm. I should be able to play anyone past present and future as an ideal. But I think the reason that clicked for me is that, dude, I am a complete uh, for rent space. <laughs> right. So text, whatever's in the text, the, the process of getting better and better as an actor has been removing whatever interferes with adapting immediately the circumstance of that character. I mean, that's just the way I work. Yeah. So all of a sudden people think I'm from Chicago. All of a sudden people think I'm from Baltimore. All of a sudden they think mm -hmm. I'm from New York. But I can almost guarantee you in every case, the character was from those places. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Sure. For you know? sure. And that, so the perception of me, I think being like a blue collar East coast guy just came because I played a bunch of those parts in a row. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Right. Well, you did study at uh, Yale post post grad grad, right? Yeah. And then yeah. and uh, so what what kind of curriculum is there there? Like, what do you what do you how are you like? Uh, what's your like uh, entry level technique that you're learning there? It's old school conservatory training where you do movement. You know, the, in the first year of acting, it's Chekhov, Ibsen, um, moving into Strindberg. Um, Beckett, and then on your way into the classics for the second year, Shakespeare, Restoration Comedy, all that stuff. Mm. And then third year is kind of character development, um, naturalism, and then it's augmented with speech, voice, just old fashioned, wow. you know, oh, that's great. come in like a scrub and ideally, go, you know, leave as a pro, as somebody who has something to offer professionally. Right. But and by the way, you know, in the model of of training for theater, there's very little, very little, you know, time given to working on camera, which is a completely different. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Experience, obviously. But the funny thing is, and I've said this before, I had gone to college. It wasn't for me. I dropped out pretty fast. And I moved to L.A. and started taking acting classes. And I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. OK my early, early twenties, that place was a similar idea, conservatory based, you know, um, voice, speech, movement, scene study, but that's when I caught the bug. Mm. And so I had a lot of teachers there, you know, this is the late eighties. So a lot of teachers were sort of still, um, left over from the, um, actor studio Strasburg mode. Right. Mm -hmm. So, that was all the sense memory stuff. That was all those like cliche exercises um, that people think of with acting class. So I kind of had that training before Yale and, but I knew I, I, I needed to know more. Right. So I was auditioning for these programs kind of on my own. I didn't know how it really worked and getting nowhere like Juilliard, um, I got auditioned for ACT, NYU. All I knew is that they, they were MFA and theater programs. I never even considered Yale because I dropped out of college. Right. And mm -hmm. my parents are from LA. Like the East Coast to me was like, why would anybody want to go there? You know? <laughs> right. Like, not only that, but we wouldn't be welcome there. That was right. kind of like how, how strange it was. And um, anyway, I was getting nowhere with these programs. And I got a job. From a up in San Francisco, I had moved back in. My parents lived up there and I got a job playing a dinosaur in a kid's show. Mm. I got 10 bucks an hour and I was like, uh, I pretty much made it. Like, <laughs> nice. Because my expectations were so low. Mm -hmm. And um, one day I was auditioning for a play. It was Cowboy Mouth in San Francisco, just like in, in North Beach, one of the, kind of a DIY production. And when I was leaving, this guy said, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah. And he said, you're, you're interesting. And I said, fucking finally. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I've always thought so. Yeah. Yeah. Else seems to. And he said, do you want to train more? And I said, I do. 
I do. And he said, would you like to go to Yale? And I said, what? And he, you know, I'm on the faculty at the Yale School of Drama. Would you consider going there? And I was like, dude, wow. I consider it. Yes. I didn't even apply because I dropped out of college. And he said, that's not a, that's not a requirement. Wow. For yeah. the that's amazing. Graduate program. Anyway, he sent me an application. I filled it out. And then I got a letter saying I was admitted. And you're 20, early 20s now? 21. Wow. 21. Wow. I got great instincts for telling. Yeah. <clears throat> and when you're getting, when you're getting like just uh, this, this incredible like curriculum, are you, do you feel like being a 21 year old artist that you like, was your hunger there? Were you like, this is fucking exactly what I needed? Yeah. My hunger was there. I mean, I was 24 seven. I mean, I carried a, uh, um, a copy of the Anthony and Arto Manifesto Theater of Cruelty in my back pocket. Wow. wow. I read anything that had the word theater in it or was a play. That's all I had. You know, I'd go to see, I was the guy who would go see plays and then write letters to the people in the plays. Wow, man. <laughs> That's amazing. I, I just had to express my, I had to build a relationship with something that was not going to reciprocate wow, you know um, so it was all passion i was extremely idealistic i've always been kind of somewhat abstractly inspired and have always had a, a experiential and conceptual vocabulary that isn't super linear mm. and uh, but what does that mean abstractly ex inspired it's like being possessed of the impulse to create mm. and connecting that impulse with not the mystical, but sort of the spiritual, meaning the, the layer of energy that is not going to be um, incorporated into my personality, mm -hmm. its instincts, its feel, and it's being guided by something that, I mean, is, is frankly at odds with ego, you know, oh, and no. I say at odds with it because my ego is completely you know, trying to run the show. It always mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So, so like navigating, you know, for example, um, the desire to be, um, for this, to be approved of, to be, you know, complimented with the bigger desire to sort of be in this performative space where I have some, I, it's like a trance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something comes through and I have an emotional experience or, or a psychological experience that doesn't correspond to my reality, but instead one that's on a page. That felt so much more sublime and so much more powerful. So, so I went into Yale with an awareness of that, but I was really young. I was really immature. I had long hair. Um, I was very California. I was super into metal. And I just got to New Haven and I was like, I got to quit because I was also fucking scared shitless. <laughs> right, right. Which was a feeling familiar to me, you know, pretty much since my fourth grade birthday. Yeah, me too. I get that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just always had, and, and there was something about, there's always been something really kind of mysteriously influential about that contact with fear, because as I've gotten older, I think aside from all the obvious things there are to be afraid of, if you're a, if you're an artist whose nerves are on the outside of your body, mm -hmm. the notion that I somehow wouldn't be able to transcend my own inhibitions and my own insecurities to get into a realm where I can make art at the level that I wanted to. Yeah. Would, so, so, I mean, it was really scary. So like, it was challenging and it was a gnarly three years and I learned, you know, a lot of the right things and a lot of the wrong things. But the bottom line is what that whole experience means to me now is some stranger saw something in me and reached out and pulled me up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's, that's basically, you know, that's on my to-do list every time I work. It's not about like, here, let me hook you up with my agent, but it's like, I see you. Right. Yeah. Right. 
And I think that's important for us to do for each other. Mm -hmm. That's, that's That's, interesting. It's inspiring. Yeah. You Mm -hmm. know, um, that's interesting. I feel like uh, uh, Nick Cage talks about the uh, nouveau sh- uh, shaman- shamanism, mm-hmm. um, and it's like uh, it's like kind of having this relationship with, you know, viewing the actors as medicine men. Like something else is taking mm-hmm. over, you know, and uh, and uh, but a lot of this, a lot of this uh, stuff you're speaking of, which I kind of we we talked about in a, a prior episode. Just like um, I'm kind of been tapping into this this stuff that's beyond the more like uh you know uh this curriculum this like you know like dealing with the subconscious you know like writing letters to the subconscious like trusting your dreams guiding you and and that kind of shit but that's not uh that's kind of that's not yell right that's just kind of your own like uh thing right it is but i think it's like one of the opportunities of the artist is like you know when you as you open up the bandwidth is massive yeah and it's overwhelming for a lot of people i think but you have some um say in which frequency you listen to Mm -hmm. yeah and i've just always felt like i'll tell you when things really start because like i finished yale and i did some good work there and i didn't quit and I made some friends and, but at the end of that, you know, most people are like, Jesus, I got into Yale, man. Now it's all about, you know, uh, let's get that career going. Yeah. And I'm sure mm-hmm. agents are gonna love me because I went to Yale. And when we did our showcase at the end, nobody wanted to sign me. Mm. And, and that was, that was trippy because, you know, it's only 10 men and six women. And, this was 92 and um, 350 people from every agency, casting director, network studio showed up to watch so they could sort of get the early pick, you know, mm-hmm. they all said no. Interesting. And I, I, it was terrible, but it was the beginning of actually becoming the actor that I think I am because it wasn't about not quitting. It was about their, for me, it was about their hundred percent right because I'm not coming from the right place. I'm not coming from a place where if I walk on stage, there's a human being there. I'm coming from a place where if I walk on stage, I'm justifying some, I'm, I'm giving you a reason to think I matter. Wow. And it wasn't until I just started, I moved to Chicago and I started over and I sent out my, my, picture and resume to the agents there and then I started getting cast in plays and I just I just told myself I wasn't going to be full of shit yeah that's the only thing like maybe maybe I'll get nowhere but I'm gonna I'm gonna be truthful like on moment yeah just like uh so like authenticity in the moment became your like watchword right yeah well it was the it was like that's when I discovered that I have a whole other sense of being basically from the belly button down that has nothing to do with this Mm -hmm. where this energy this creative energy um it's kind of for lack of a better word talent you know is the kind of shorthand that's where it lives for me and i was just ignoring it i was just i wouldn't let it be an influence and um Forcing myself to work from that place of simplicity and authenticity sort of inverted that and it let my talent take over wow. to the point where it, it's still like this in, in uh, I don't know, uh, this is related somehow to me. Um, 2017, I did a, the world premiere of this uh, mammoth play called The Penitent in New York, and it was a lot of material. It was classic David Mamet and very dense. Mm. and Every single time the cue light went off for me to start the show, my mind said, don't do it, dude. <laughs> don't do what? Do not, <laughs> don't go. Yeah. Do not too go much. out there. <laughs> I'd be listening to Metallica in the <laughs> airbus, whatever the fuck those things are, and take them out, and the little red light would go, bing, and that's when I'm supposed to enter. And I really paid attention to it because my mind would say, I know I've told you this before, but this time I really mean it. If you go on stage right now, you, 
it's gonna you're gonna die like <laughs> you're gonna completely fall apart it's not you can't do this for your safety's sake that's what was going mm -hmm. on up here and i think that just comes from you know the more open and accepting you are of what's happening in the moment the ego and fear and all of that are part of the mix mm -hmm. But it's it's just an example of like, well, okay, well, I did that show for three or four months. Like obviously I never listened to that voice. Right. And I stopped listening to that voice when I moved to Chicago. And that's when I started to actually build a career. So that voice can shut the fuck up. It's welcome to stay. You know, I don't feed it, but it's kind of like I think a lot of actors confuse that voice with their talent. And they try mm -hmm. to hedge their bets. And get, Bro, yes. You know, yeah. you know what yes. I mean? Yeah, it's the fear. I mean, uh, you know, uh, who's the guy who said, who's the president who said it's the only thing we have to fear is fear. So, JFK. Can, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we were, uh, sorry not to get too tangential, but we were talking this uh, the other day, um, me and Brendan, and um, and I'm rewatching um a breaking bad oh, yeah. and um there's this great monologue that um that walter white gives to um uh Dean, to hank yeah, yeah to hank yeah and uh and he's basically saying and i've known this to be true of people who uh recently had a, a cancer di cancer diagnosis mm -hmm. um and he was saying in this monologue you know ever since the um he, he says i've had fear my whole life like uh, just fear mm -hmm. and, but ever since the cancer diagnosis um, it, it's, it's, I've slept like a baby, you know, because it, it, all it ever was, was the fear of whatever was going to happen, but that's all it was. And then when the thing, there's nothing left to fear, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? yeah, it's like a blessing. Almost. And, you know, and we're all parents, man. It's like you, you, we we're coasting through life and then, you know, we're parents. Uh, no, you're a parent. And then it's like, oh, you think you, you only think, you know, fear until you like have a kid. <laughs> so you really have something to lose. Yeah. yeah you know? Yeah. yeah. No, it's true. So acting is actions. That's it. Like, I'm yeah. never the guy who sits down and says, how about if we do it like this? Or I was thinking, as soon as you hear me say, you know, I was thinking if we're ever working together again, you got to punch me in the throat. Okay. Because if I'm thinking, um, I got to start over. Interesting, man. Right. What a the place, mind just gets a, in the way. What a place to be, man. So yeah. when you um, when you kind of rein, uh, reinvent yourself or kind of like... Um, uh, with this new kind of um, trying your best to separate yourself from from this this ego, which which is not your talent, you find yourself doing these plays at Steppenwolf, and uh, you know Pat Healy was on it was mm -hmm. a friend of ours and was on our show. He speaks highly yeah. of you. Um, I imagine that you that was a pretty cool uh, couple years, right? Yeah, it was great, man. Yeah. Dude. It was great. Like I just came to life and I, I have extremely fond feelings for Pat. Yeah. Um, Pat was the guy who walked me into my audition for Clockwork Orange, which was the first play I did oh, yeah. at Steppenwolf. And um, that was 94. It's pretty great, you know, to, to go back that far. There's so many people like that. that right. Yeah. Yeah. Around that time, I did Richard II at the Goodman and Nick Offerman and I were like the gardeners. Mm. In, in <laughs> nice which yeah. was hilarious. Um, but yeah, that starting with that play and then I did this really weird improv experiment there that I kind of poked around with for a few years. And, and that along these lines, um, just briefly, like there were some guys, some great improvisers there, Tracy and um, Tracy Letts and Michael had this thing yeah. called bang, bang. Um, I used to go to that a lot. And then I did some of it in LA and, and that was that was my chance to sort of get an audience and 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 basically live through all the things that I was I was sort of afraid of or that weren't supposed to happen. So I would go out on stage and then just stop and just have nothing to say. Mm. One time I took off my shirt and I was like, I'm so insecure about my body. Does anybody want to sort of review what they see and what I look like. Wow. Which obviously nobody did because it's so fucking it's such a terrible thing to ask an audience to do. <laughs> but <laughs> all these things that like I just realized that like this this work is not for me is not a given. I have to earn it and I have to earn every sort of level of 
every breakthrough I had to earn. It wasn't just going to come because I was a, I was a, I was a nice guy. Yeah. So, so, you know, not knowing my lines, not knowing what to say, feeling like an asshole while people are looking at me, all these insecurities, I just acted them out in this improv thing. And, you know, lo and behold, it's just like you said, it's like, yeah, you survive. It's no big deal. But every time I kind of addressed one of those things, it's like a video game. It like uncovered all this new energy and all this new flow. Wow. Mm-hmm. It's like, and things got very, very, very simple, you know, to the point where in, I think right around the second season of the deuce, I was starting to hear that voice again. I mean, I just basically started working in 95 and I just really haven't stopped. Yeah. And mm-hmm. in, um, the deuce was like my third series at HBO. Um, and the second one with David Simon and I was in great company and, um, but I was feeling like in here, I was feeling inhibited. I was feeling like the, my talent was trying to get my attention again. And I, and I, so I just gave it, you know, you just do all this weird shit, sit down, listen, write it out. Um, and I, eventually I, it became clear what it was saying was, dude, you got to be more boring. Interesting. Huh. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? I was like, like if it were, you know, if it were illustrated in a conversation yeah. with myself, <laughs> right. it's like I'm getting this impulse to say, you got to be more boring. And I, and I'm like, well, I'm already so fucking boring. And it's like, no, you're not. You're acting boring. You're you're trying to be remarkable mm-hmm. all the time. You're trying to find some way to be remarkable, to be invaluable to the process, and it's holding you back. You need to disappear more. Let this whatever character is there take more of the foreground, mm-hmm. and that includes your energy in real time and space when you're shooting and when you're building, you know, during the process. Right. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I'll try, and you know soon as I started working that way, the very first thing that happens is you wrap a scene and nobody goes, dude, that was great. Instead, they're just like, great, got it. Moving on. Mm -hmm. So instantly, you know, as a 50 year old, I'm like, whoa, that was kind of like crack to me getting those compliments. Yeah. And how much, how much of my process is kind of conforming itself to how I can get one of those compliments. And what happens if I, like blow that off mm. and just disappear and just be like the dude who worked that day. Yeah. And um, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but like to me, that's the antithesis of my original desire. My original desire to do this was to like push people out of the way and be like, check me out. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. 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 Be a star. No. Yeah. I understand that. And it, it's something uh, I kind of, um, there is this thing, you know, we, we like in, in, um, in the quest to be a good, um, a good actor or good, like when I say a good actor, I don't mean a good actor. I mean like a, a good actor, a good castmate, someone who gets along with people. So we tell the, ourselves these things like, okay, well, we're going to be in service of the story. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's these things we say that I've always done and, uh, that I've done. And then it occurred to me, uh, like recently, When I've looked back and found myself to be uh, my perceptions is is just less than remarkable in a specific uh, role. It's because for so long, you know, I was I was just I was just kind of trying to like fighting for my life in a scene to just like, okay, do the thing. Okay, what's my fell safe? Natural. Say it natural. How would Ronnie say it? Just be. Oh, that fucking worked. So (laughs) so what I when I look back is like a retrospect of this, like these performances are like, oh, yeah, he did his job. But then I was thinking to myself just recently. So it's funny uh, you're saying this, that like we go to see Guns N' Roses, but we also go to see a slash solo. Right. Mm -hmm. So like (laughs) the the components, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, how do we, uh, you know, otherwise I've, I mean, aren't you just kind of, because there's, there's something that happens to, um, the supporting actor. And I don't mean that this, I know that this could be a little like uh, gross and and victimy, but you know, we get, well, if you're six, seventh down the call sheet, you're supporting a guy, you're there, you maybe your exposition, you know what I mean? Um, and you're, you're being a good little actor that's moving, you know what I mean? Uh, sometimes it's fun to just like, 
you know, throw some arbitraries in there, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you're right, though. You're absolutely right. That's so accurate. I mean, that's the. Uh, I mean, for me, it's like. It's 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 like if if seven plumbers were working on the same job and one or two of the plumbers, like got to do the real sexy work and everybody else was like, you know, cleaning the toilets and, you know, <laughs> your job of like keeping the sewer clean is really fucking hard. And the dude who's just shining the brass on the faucet in the kitchen, <laughs> yeah. right. You know, it's impossible to not notice that. Right. You know? Right. And, um, you know, maybe someday dude will, the three of us can have a whole conversation about that. Cause right. that is, mm -hmm. that's, that's a reality of a, of a, of being a professional actor. I think, where do I fit in? It's like, you know, I loved my time on true blood, but essentially I got, you know, it's like, I was basically playing one string on the bass mm. and I, I'm really grateful for the chance to figure out how to take that one string and bend it and turn it into what I could. But it's like, I wasn't going to, if I was going to solo, it was going to be because that one note blew everything out. And right. that was going to happen mm -hmm. once every couple seasons, you know? Right, right, right. What kept coming, kept me coming back to that was like, uh, well, can I do that better than anybody else? I mean, if, I, if I'm just going to play an E chord, like, can I play the E with more resonance than anybody ever has? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. So my... So I was like, then shut the fuck up and keep trying, keep, keep working that's on great. your eat. Yeah, you know that's mean? great. That's cool. I love that. I love that. <clears throat> um, when you, uh, I want to back up because I want to, I, I was, do you remember 1997? In general? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> because I was looking at your resume and I don't know if there's been any actor in the history of the Screen Actors Guild was there a movie that you that was in the theaters in 1997 that you weren't in? <laughs> yeah. You were ubiquitous. Yeah. Because uh, do you remember how that felt? And there were so many movies that I wasn't in because I auditioned for all of them. <laughs> right. Because you got eight. What, what, what came out that year? You had Face Off. Uh, Face Off. Uh, eight, Devil's Advocate. Devil's Advocate. Oh, yeah. eight, a big year. Eight millimeter? Eight millimeter. I shot in 97. It came out in 98. Um but yeah, that was a pretty great year. Right. I yeah, mean, for sure. I um. Do you feel that just, heat? Do you remember feeling the heat of that? Like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And I, I was, I was. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there were some great casting directors who really took a liking to me, and I was kind of overwhelmed. I. I and not because I was some kind of a big deal, but because I thought I'm never going to, I'm just going to work in theater. Like if I ended up understudying a view from the bridge, you know, and living in a studio apartment in hell's kitchen alone, I was going to feel like a success. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when that stuff started happening, I was, I was, yeah, I, I was very happy. Yeah. I gotta I'm say, sure. I, and I'm not, it was, it was and I'm not, and I'm not like, um, like kind of, um, saying in a cheap way, I'm just talking about like in a way that would ultimately mean like the next job, you know what I mean? Or the next, uh, you know, like, yeah. uh, I mean, um, because yeah, that, I mean, just so many good. So what, what year was third watch? Was that your first show TV? Was that your first series regular? Yeah. 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 And dude, every single one of these breakthroughs these career breakthroughs came from this is what i mean by like I, I i'm not a straight line guy like face off i went and met i think it was mindy Marin, and it was just a pre-meeting you know and i'd read the script and she's like what part do you like and every, anyone who's seen that movie knows there's like a thousand parts in that mm -hmm. movie there was one beat in the script where nick's character looks across a prison and this guy is like yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah staring at him. yeah that was it that was all it was in the script <laughs> and i go well i like this character and she's like who's that and i was like he he looks across him at the prison and she's like not one of the cops not one of those I was like no i don't know just that 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 the vibe of that just stuck with me she's yeah. like it's got no lines <laughs> and I was like, like, here's the extras like, casting <laughs> number 
<laughs> what can I tell you? That's, that's, that's what jumped out at me, you know? Yeah. So she's like, okay, I want you to come meet John Woo. And I said, well, since the character has no lines, would it, would it be um, um, too much if I just like wrote a quick scene of like what that character would say if, if, oh, cool. if uh, you know, he talked? She's like, yeah, I guess that's okay. So I go meet him and uh, his producer and, and I do it and I do my scene. And it was about my character just coming back from the prison poetry workshop. And he had seen this dude and he had to write a poem about it. And he's reading it. It's his lame ass poem. He's reading to his cellmate. It's amazing. And then three <laughs> months go by, I hear nothing. And one day a FedEx comes to my apartment in Brooklyn and there's from Paramount and there's a script for face off. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? And I look through it. And all of a sudden that character is written into Amazing. this whole escape wow. sequence, this whole fight thing. None of that was there. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you're the guy who's getting, uh, uh, who's getting all zapped up. Right. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, we, yeah, we yeah, yeah, yeah. of course fight. you plan the whole like, thing that, yeah. Uh, we stick together and, yeah. but like that, you know, it's like never was my, was my mission how am i going to make this part bigger or get in this movie it was just following the logic of this little beacon in the gut of like where are you connected where are you connected what can you actually feel like what can you drop into in this situation devil's yeah. advocate they flew me i was in la shooting face off and they said they want to read you with keanu and they flew me out there and uh I, you know, I, I didn't know any movie stars or anything like that. And, um, got to the audition. He's out, he's outside the audition, smoking a cigarette. I smoked at the time. I lit a cigarette and I was like, Hey, I'm Chris. I'm gonna go read for, for this part. And he's like, Oh, cool, cool. And I was like, how do you think I should do it? <laughs> okay. I know. Nice. It's amazing. <laughs> what do you say? You know, and he's like, I don't know, man, just make it real. And just, da, da, da. and I was like, all right, cool, cool. And and did that? Like, Were you really curious as to, to his impression of yeah, was how a you should do it? Answer a question. That is what possessed me in that moment. <laughs> nice. Amazing. The point being, like, when you fucking empty out, right? Because it's all for me. It's like the let go. Everything when we do it, like I know your work, Ronnie. When you when you're like when you're when you're because you get to play things that are sort of like cranked up at the higher end of the scale. It's like. Boom. It's like it's coming, it's coming out. Right. And right. It's not discharging, it's contained focused energy, but you're letting it go and into the person or the image or the situation that you're, you know, in the middle of. And that exhale, that's why I feel like God loves actors or whoever created us, because mm. Constantly exhaling, you have a chance to rehearse the most important thing in your work twenty four seven. Every time you let go and empty out, that's and sort beautiful. Of, boom! That impulse comes. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, questions like that to Keanu, writing that little scene, all that stuff. Um, they're never my idea. Nothing is ever my idea. It just comes through. Brilliant. It's great instincts. Do you think? Um, do you think just because an impulse happens um, that it should be grabbed, followed, uh, or do you kind no. of uh, monitor them? Like, wait a minute, let's let's run this through quality control here. Yeah. Not all impulses are. <laughs> I honestly think what what you know, it's like my perception of talent now is like when we're like like when you're jamming, like when you're open and the frequency is open. There are infinite choices coming your way one at a time. And what the actual talent is, like the great painter who knows what stroke and what color to choose, the actual talent is in that moment picking the one choice and fully committing to it. Because mm -hmm. I think if you look, you know, if you, if you sort of broke it down at any given time, once you're out of your head, if you're in your head, everything's stiff and kind of fake secondhand and it's okay, but it's a quality of the experience rather than the actual experience. Right. And what's happening is you have an, a sort of oversight, this sort of, and that's where the creativity is, where you pick the choice in the moment that's the best choice. And I think that every now and then you do a take on film where that's true all the way through. Right. But if you wrap a roll and you've done it 90% of the time, you, you're a killer. 
Yeah, man. Because you fail and you, you know, you get to do it again and all of that. But I'm a, I have, I'm, I, I faithfully believe that it's always, if you've prepared right and you're, you have the courage to open yourself up to the, because for me, it's always like, like this, this character I play on heels as a pro wrestler and I had to change my body a lot. It's a lot of words. And I have to prepare like a motherfucker to be ready for that. Right. Mm -hmm. But every single time we roll, the last thing I tell myself is not just throw everything away. It's like, I don't know shit. And I leave this space for something else to happen. No matter how many times I've conceived this scene, because the thing does not exist yet. Yeah, so, man. so I, you know what I mean? Like, I can't decide what it is. It doesn't exist yet until I'm with you or you in the moment. And yeah. it's happening. You know, brilliant, That's brilliant. Great. You're so right, man. You're so right. And it's such terrifying, uh, rewarding work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's why it's rewarding. Um, you know, uh, uh, Brendan is a massive fan of the wire. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, great shows, for sure. uh, and, uh, as I'm, as am I, yeah. um, so it's, it's funny. I, you know, I, we're talking about these deep things, but I do, I also want to talk about these, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes it seems like I'm derailing a, this deep conversation to like, to touch upon these actual things. Um, <laughs> My fault. No, 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 no it's, it's, brilliant. It's, it's brilliant. It's more it's, fun. It's, this it's way. more, yeah, exactly. It's like acting, right? You got all your, it's like, uh, it's like, I think like acting is like, uh, like you, for me, it was always like you, you like you're planning a itinerary from like LA to New York, right? And then you, you were, you're going to stop in Phoenix and then you're going <laughs> to, oh, I heard this place is cool. Maybe we'll go here. And then you look at the itinerary a couple of times and you throw it away. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, yeah. you know, you're going to, that shit's still going to come up. You know what I mean? <laughs> You've done the work, but you're not, you know, you're not, uh, yeah. Um, I want to know about, um, I want to ask you about, you know, you talked about Hills. We had a, a, a friend of ours, C. Thomas Howell, on the show, and he says the way that he was able to sustain a 50-year career is uh, through reinvention, right? And I want to I, – I, what do you think – and it seems to me that you are um, in the shape of your life right now, right, based on the trailers for Hills – so far yeah uh which is which is uh, impressive as shit I, and i don't know how you do it as a 45 year old dad i mean i'm like uh, i cannot figure out how to look like i did when i was 35 but what do you think of as an artist reinvention do you feel do you think about that ever is that not something you think about? yeah as an artist i do yeah as an artist i do not as a careerist i have no career game whatsoever okay so I admire people who do, um, because I think that it's realistic and I think that, you know, it's a marketplace and I think that, you know, people who are able to position themselves or get people excited again, um, from some aspect of their life or appearance. Yep. Um, I admire that a lot for me. I've been lucky cause like, you know, let's say let's go in the last five years, I played an astronaut a CIA dude in Watergate, a pro wrestler, Senator Joe McCarthy, um, and a pimp. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so every single one of those characters is its own ample opportunity to reinvent. And I just try to put it all into the work, but I'll tell you what, at 56 and 30 years in, I feel like I'm proud of that and I stand by it because it's just all I can do. But I also think that people notice your sort of biographical and external reinventions much more than they do your creative ones. Like, Interesting. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, in the fine print, if the definition of an actor is to be able to play anybody realistically according to the terms and circumstances of the world they're in, right. you know, it should be a good thing to be transformative and to blend in and go from an astronaut to a pimp seamlessly. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, business-wise, it, 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 it's sort of, it's a loss leader in a way, because you're good. You, you make the project better by working that way, but there's no glory. There's no 
it's a it's a bit of a conundrum because you know every now and it takes patience because you know what was the wire 20 years ago mm-hmm. and i got enormous um enormous um attention yeah for that for that part um, deservedly so oh yeah well it was i mean they wrote it they wrote it so well and i just didn't back off from anything in the script but i wore a fat suit and i played a lot older than i was at the time and and um and i was in full you know the the pedal was all the way down <laughs> yeah frank sabatka <laughs> yeah that was one of the great most complicated characters ever for the small screen in my opinion it was an incredible performance thank you. yeah thank yeah. you thank you very much and that was I your first time him. that was your first time working with david simon yeah 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 the great um but yeah and he's amazing but dude when people i mean i've been so lucky because like my my uh my series regular jobs have been with Alan Ball, John Wells, mm-hmm. David Simon, mm. you know, uh, like the you know, Michael Malley, the, the greatest writers, I think, you know, yeah, certainly have. among the greatest writers of yeah. our generation. Yeah. So, so there's definitely, you know, a debt that I owe them because I, I, I don't, I'm not a guy who's like, wouldn't it be better if I said this, you know, because the writing's been so good generally in, in what I've done. Right. But I think that's a cool point that you're making or, or that you brought up. Like, I, I, I think the reason I admire people who reinvent, like, here's a classic example to me. When Michael Chiklis got all ripped so he could do The Shield. And before that, he was known for this series called The Commish on CBS, where he's sort of like a likable cop. Right. And, and whenever that was, 2007, 2008, he did The Shield, and he became this sort of like rogue cop, you know, and had this alpha vibe and it and it was amazing he got a whole other you know layer of career out of that he did an amazing job um and i think that that is a bit of a white whale for me like you know to be honest with heels it's like i got hair extensions i put on 22 pounds of muscle learned how to wrestle enough so that my double could yeah yeah shout out to him um He's, you know, like he, he's who really makes me look good. But, but I believe in my case, the muses are like, dude, you keep wanting to get a pat on the back for shit that is just labor. And this mm-hmm. isn't supposed to be easy. You're supposed to put the work in, you know, you're, you're making a living doing the thing you love. Um, and if, if you get a good review, great. If you don't, it doesn't change the work you did and stop feeling sorry for yourself and, you know, see how much more work you can do. But That's like, great, man. Mm-hmm. That's great. I, uh, I definitely feel that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, uh, I had to, add, you know, I was noticing something. Um, so what, what years were the wire? You were on the wire for one year. What year was yeah, that? Season two, right? Yeah. In 2003 season mm-hmm. two. And then, I was thinking you had this True Blood run, and now I'm thinking you got The Wire, and then you got True Blood, and then you weren't uh, working with HBO. I guess what I'm wondering is why the fuck weren't you on The Sopranos? <laughs> <laughs> That's always Ronnie's question. <laughs> well, here's what's so funny. Um, right when I wrapped Eight Millimeter, and James Gandolfini and I, you know, kind of became friendly, and we finished, and I was like, "So, what are you doing now?" And he was like, "I gotta go do this fucking series." <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you don't want to do it? He's like, "Fuck no!" But I gotta go do this fucking series, you know. Um, so that was after The Sopranos pilot had been shot, and I remember I got that script, and they wanted me to audition for the priest, who was okay. in the first couple mm-hmm. of seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I honestly passed. Yeah. If I remember. Um, but that was a, uh, dude, I don't know how, what'd you say? You're 46. 40. Are you guys in your mid forties? Yeah. Mid forties. Okay. When I was in my, so I was 31 when I did eight millimeter and, and, um, anyway, back then when Sopranos was the thing, you should have seen what it was like to go to any audition in New York. Well, it really? was like every dude who drove somebody or worked the door at some club in the Bronx or some club, 
way out in Brooklyn suddenly had an agent wow. and everybody thought they were the next James Gandolfini and they were a star and you'd walk into these auditions and it'd be like people would be like what time's my fucking appointment <laughs> Only for fucking 15 minutes. everybody was a star every you know wise guy I mean? yeah. <laughs> every wise guy in New Jersey showing up <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's really funny. And then you played uh, Gandolfini's actual son's dad in The Deuce, which is pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, this is what I'm saying, okay? Like, I don't know how much time we have left, but this is the magic yeah. for me, mm -hmm. working, committing to this place, of working from this place that's not about, it's just coming from something bigger. It's like, I was, uh, like, I can't get into it into too much detail, but like, I did the Menendez Brothers miniseries with mm -hmm. Edie Falco, and we spent a lot of time talking about Gandolfini, and <clears throat> um, and uh, it was really moving. Mm -hmm. And when I wrapped that a couple months later, I went back to uh, the Deuce, and they're like, "Hey, we cast your son." I said, "Who is it?" "Oh, it's Michael Gandolfini." Oh, man. It's wild. I was like, "No kidding." So Michael's like my son now. He's like mm -hmm. an adopted child in my family. Wow, uh, wow that's this, so cool. We, we it's it, that came to me in the most beautifully organic way and so it was one of his first jobs you know doing the deuce those episodes of the deuce so i got to be there with him as he's growing and he's an exceptional person and he's a unbelievably um brave kind of um discerning open warm-hearted kid mm -hmm. good good friend he seems it but it, the enrichment of the present in my personal life from something that happened through work is not like I'm not a guy who's going to jobs to add to my family. In fact, I don't know about you, but I don't like when they use the family metaphor at work. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's a stretch sometimes. <laughs> yeah, like come on, man. I'm a, yeah. like I'm a 45 year old man. I got kids. I got my yeah. wife who I love. I have a family. I don't need new friends. <laughs> And my family's not going to fire me. Right. You know what I mean, my family's not going to like make me. It's like it's like yeah, fuck you, man. Yeah, uh, you're not my family. Right. Um, Agreed. So when something like that happens, you know, it's such a gift of I think finding a like a more um, just a more gratifying way through the whole thing, and I think that's available to us. Yes, we're trying to book jobs. Yes, we're trying to stay busy. Yes, we're trying to stay valued but not only is all that stuff already true when you're working from a place that's open-hearted and brave and humble but the things that do come back to you are like actual treasure mm. it's it's more than money you know what i mean yeah i do yeah, and i think 100%. it's quite extraordinary and i'm i'm I kind of uh not to be hyperbolic and not to put a feather in your cap, but it's kind of throwing me off how kind of extraordinary what you're saying is because mm -hmm. I keep contextualizing with my own, my mm -hmm. own path and my experience. Like, Oh, I do that. <laughs> so right. God, I'm a hack. But, um, <laughs> but I will say, I wonder this, um, this, we don't got much longer with you, but I want to ask this uh, God, or the source, let's call it the source, right? The source of this thing that's giving us these gifts. Um, because I believe that as well. How um, how often do you think this source is giving us stuff? I, th I first of all, I so appreciate that question because um, it's really like peeling back the rug and seeing what's underneath. What I see is that it's never stops. Mm. Mm -hmm. There is a constant unbroken stream of inspiration, of whatever you need, empathy, compassion, courage, patience. Um, but we have to meet it. It doesn't always, you know, it's like, if I'm an open channel, it doesn't mean that that thing's going to always come find me and go through me. I have to live in a way where I can meet it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's where the humility is a really important component because it's like at any given time, I gotta be, I gotta remind myself, it's not about me and what can I adjust and what, what can I reach for? However uncomfortable it makes me um, to get to where the flow is mm. and, and, and how, how do I, 
stay, you know, like the epitome of arrogance for me is that I think that flow is going to come to me all the time, mm-hmm. you know? Right. I'm just grateful there is one. And I know there is one. The next hour that we do someday, dude, I will give you guys so many examples where things came through. Can you give us I one? Found, yeah. This this one is, um, I was doing a Jez Butterworth play. I don't know how you know much theater you guys read about or watch, but Jez is one of the best. Jerusalem is his last big production. Mm-hmm. Very many for that. And I've done roles in three of his plays. We're, I was doing a play with Emily Mortimer and Jonathan Cake, and it took place about 100 miles outside London. This was in 2008. And, um, and we had these really weird accents. And that it was a few previews in where I realized that none of my choices and none of my performance were coming from me. Mm. It just hit me in the middle of a scene. I was like, fuck, I'm not doing any of this, man. Where is wow. this coming from? And I'm on stage, you know what I mean? And I'm like, well, you're gonna have to deal with that later because right now you're in a scene with somebody. And and then my voice is like, yeah, but do you realize this means you can never take credit ever again for your work? Because <laughs> you're just opening up to it. Yeah. It's not about you, bro. It's not about you. And I was like, shut up, dude. I got to do this scene. This is all going on. Yeah, turn a monologue. And um, at the end of that performance, um, that play was very well reviewed. and. Um, and at the end of that performance, there was a woman from 100 miles outside London who had come to see that play. Mm. And she was like, I have just have to tell you that that dialect, I, I just, are, are you from there? And I was like, no, I'm from L.A. And she was like, I mean, it's like I could tell you the corner that the person like that, that's how they speak. And oh. I was like, wow, oh. that's, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And then um, whoever I was with was like, how long did you work on the dialect? And I was like, I, I didn't. Wow. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, I just, I was like, just rehearsing the play. I could hear this lyricism and I could hear these sort of idiosyncratic vowel sounds. And I just started doing them and just do it. And it just dawned on me that like, I, that accent just literally was presented to me. Mm-hmm. And I just let it move my mouth the way it told me to and and i mean i don't know about you but that's i can't explain that i i didn't listen to monty python movie and imitate their accent or the other two actors were british in the play i didn't do their accent it's like it just was delivered and i let it happen that's bro that's That's incredible he channeled it that's beautiful all the time and it's just about getting the right shit out of the way to let it do the work mm-hmm. and surrendering, surrendering, you know. Um, and I find that miraculous. I do too, it man. Is because amazing. yeah, it's like the um, the unconscious, subconscious, whichever it is, um, is infinite and knows all the things, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and um, I, I've had a version of that. I've had a version of being able to pull something. You know, I did a, um, yeah, I did this the new Lady in the Lake, which is a Alma Harrell, who's one of my favorite directors. She did um, uh, Honey Boy, but it's this show that comes out, this limited series, and like talk about reinvention. You know, a few months before, I I had said, uh, you know, I'm a fucking I got a six year old kid, like, uh, and I was telling like friend in the other day, like, how long uh, did they want to see me fucking robbing banks <laughs> yeah, here? Being a bad and guy. I, so I was like, you know, fuck, I'm just gonna cut my hair. For some reason, I had this always had this weird attachment to my, my hair has to be long. I just cut it like short, and then like right when that happened, I got like play a cop on this fucking limited yeah. series. It's like, oh, wow. what the fuck was I afraid with the of? Cosmos, yeah. But I, you know, I had a similar type of trust with the, with you know, with the Baltimore accent was which was kind of tough. Um, and uh, it kind of came through and, um, I think it's a beautiful thing, man. And I, I wish we had another hour because, uh, I would love to fucking talk more about this. Um, but, uh, you've, you've, you blow me away, man. You really yeah. do. And, uh, I'm, I'm so excited for, uh, everything you've done. And I think I, I'm just so grateful that you're in our business and, uh, and hopefully we get to work together on something one day. And, uh, Thank you. and, uh, 
Yeah, I'm just kind of blown away by you, man. Um, so thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you, Chris. It was really yeah. enlightening. Thank you, brother. I yeah. so appreciate it. Let's do it again. And I'll, I swear to God, I'll try to do resume nuts and bolts. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is, I, this was incredible. Phenomenal. This is, yeah. I like this better. Yeah. Wait, that's I like what we're this trying better. To I just, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the shit that matters. And, um, yeah, thank you, my brother. Yeah. And, and, uh, you, let's, let's talk soon, man. Appreciate you. Right, Thanks, now. Chris. All right. Bye.